Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Monday, August 7, 2023. Federal government closes early, and First Lady Jill Biden cancels an event at the White House because of the threat of severe weather, including possible tornadoes. Secretary of State Antony Blinken marks the 25th anniversary of the bombings of the U.S. embassies in Tanzania and Kenya, which killed more than 200 people. State Department spokesman giving an update on the ongoing military coup in the East African country of Niger, and also this past weekend's peace summit talks with Ukraine in Saudi Arabia, attended by over 40 countries, including the U.S. and China, but not Russia. U.S. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell is heckled at the annual Fancy Farm political rally in Kentucky. President Joe Biden makes allusions to his political standing while welcoming the 2022 World Series champion Houston Astros to the White House. And remembering Charles Ogletree, civil rights crusader and former Harvard Law School professor who has died at the age of 70, we'll hear part of an interview on C-SPAN 2's book TV almost 20 years ago. White House Office of Personnel Management putting out a statement today that federal employees are authorized to leave their offices two hours earlier than normal departure time or even earlier if they use unscheduled leave. And by 3 p.m. Eastern, all employees must be gone as federal offices will be closed, all due to the strong storms expected between 4 p.m. Eastern and 8 p.m. Eastern, with potential for damaging winds, hail, torrential rain and lightning, and a tornado watch in effect until 9 p.m. Eastern. First Lady Jill Biden's office with a statement, due to the tornado watch issued by the National Weather Service in the area this afternoon's back-to-school cybersecurity convening at the White House is canceled. Now to the 25th anniversary of the U.S. Embassy bombings in Kenya and Tanzania. An article from Capital News in Kenya reads that the August 7, 1998 terrorist attacks at the U.S. embassies in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam were carried out by al-Qaeda. The bombings were widely believed to have been revenge for U.S. involvement in the extradition and alleged torture of four members of Egyptian Islamic Jihad, who had been arrested in Albania in the two months prior to the attacks for a series of murders in Egypt. Although the attacks were directed at U.S. facilities, the vast majority of casualties were local citizens of Kenya and Tanzania. Again, that reporting from Capital News in Kenya. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke today at a ceremony at the National Museum of American Diplomacy at the State Department building in Washington. Every August 7th, for a quarter century now, here in Washington and in posts around the world, has come together to observe the anniversary of the U.S. Embassy bombings in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam. On that day, as everyone in this room knows all too well, 224 colleagues, friends, community members, and loved ones were cruelly taken from us, from you. Thousands of others were injured, left, as you've heard, with wounds both seen and unseen, many that will last a lifetime. Our institution was scarred, and our country was newly awoken to the scourge of terror. It is an honor for me to be able to join you today in this solemn day of remembrance. And I'm honored to be here with our colleagues on this platform, but also uh, other colleagues in this room. You have with you today um, the then Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Susan Rice, my friend and colleague of so many years, who helped rally this institution in response to the attacks. You have with you today virtually the entire senior leadership of the State Department, with our Chief of Staff, Susie George, the Deputy Secretary of State for Management and Resources, Rich Verma, the Under Secretary of State for Management, John Bass, the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Molly Fee. This, too, is some small evidence of our dedication to what this day means and what it needs to continue to mean going forward, and I just want to say a few words about that. But mostly, as I said a moment ago, I'm so grateful to Edith, to Prue, to John for their ongoing leadership, matched only uh, between what they did on that day, what they've been, done virtually on every day since, advocacy for their people, our people, in the aftermath. Ambassador Bushnell has written about how, following the bombings, she learned that 
she could not take away anyone's pain, their trauma, their anger. But, as she's put it, she could accompany them, stand with them, listen to them, support them. So that's the spirit in which I join you today, to remember the fallen, to celebrate their lives. Secretary of State Antony Blinken at today's ceremony at the State Department in Washington. He also talked about changes made to U.S. Embassy security in the 25 years since these bombings, including a requirement that embassies be at least 100 feet back from the road and that they're often surrounded by security walls. A story at UPI, Niger's military coup leadership has enforced an indefinite closure of its airspace as a deadline issued by West African nations under threat of force to release and reinstate the country's democratically elected president was to pass. Niger was overthrown July 26 by the so-called National Council for the Safeguarding of the Homeland, causing Democratic allies to condemn the coup and the capture of the West African nation's democratically elected Mohamed Bazoum. An update today from U.S. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller. What is the latest on Niger? Uh, your communications with uh, President Bazoum and, uh, you know, the situation with embassy staffing and military uh, issues. So let me take that, let me make that as, as three things, the, the communications with Bazoum and others, uh, the embassy, and then the, the assistance that uh, we paused on Friday. So uh, with respect to President Bazoum, we remain in, in touch with President B- Bazoum. Um, uh, officials from the State Department spoke to him earlier today. Um, we had conversations with him over the weekend. The Secretary talked to him last week. We remain in contact with other leaders in the region um, as well. Um, uh, the Secretary spoke with the French Foreign Minister over the weekend about how to successfully resolve the situation and restore the constitutional order. Um, with respect to the embassy, uh, we completed the order of departure on Friday. We also assisted the departure of around 100 American citizens on a charter flight that left the, uh, the country on Friday. Um, we have not seen significant other requests from American, assist- from American citizens for uh, assistance with leaving the country, but obviously we're in communication with any American citizens that are there who wish for assistance. We've asked them to register on uh, our website, and if we do get further requests for assistance, we will seek to accommodate those. And finally, with respect to assistance, uh, the, we anna- the Secretary announced on Friday uh, also that we are pausing assistance to the government um, for the time being. Um, that assistance will uh, affect uh, development aid to the government, security aid to the government. Um, it's a significant amount. Um, I-, I don't have a number because it's a pause, and it's a pause that we would hope would be reversed um, if the uh, junta leaders would step aside and restore constitutional order tomorrow. That pause would be, um, uh, the, the, the security, the pause would go away and security assistance would be reinstated. Um, but as we've made clear, hundreds of millions of dollars are at stake. Oh, hundreds of millions. Yeah. Have been All right, paused. Are, no, hundreds of millions of dollars are ultimately at stake. Okay. It's hard well, to say I, what's paused because I don't know how long the pause will take, will be in effect. Hopefully it would be lifted soon um, if President Bazoum is returned to, to authority. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller at his news conference. The Economic Community of West African States, or ECOWAS, which had given the coup leaders in Niger until yesterday to reinstate the ousted president or face the threat of military intervention, plans to meet in emergency session on Thursday to discuss next steps. The head of the office of the president of Ukraine, Andriy Yermak, who led his country's delegation to this weekend's summit in Saudi Arabia on Russia's invasion of Ukraine, posting today, we had a very productive consultation on the key principles on which a just and durable peace should be built. Forty-two countries took part in the talks, including the U.S., China, and India. Russia was not invited. The agenda was Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's peace formula, a 10-point plan that includes Russia's withdrawal from all of Ukraine's territory, justice for war crimes, and guaranteeing Ukraine's security. Questions about the summit at today's State Department news conference. Spoke a little bit about the talks in Saudi Arabia on Ukraine over the weekend. Um, But with regard to the role that China played um, in those talks, can you just speak to um, how the U.S. government viewed China's involvement, if it was productive, if they were, you know, 
actually, you know, at the table, working in a real way towards um, an end tier. Just your readout of that. We, we did believe it was productive that China attended. I'm not going to speak to the details of the meeting because it was a, a, a private meeting, but we thought it was a product. It was productive that they came. We have long said that it would be productive if ch for China to play a role in ending the war in Ukraine if it was willing to play a role that respected uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity and Ukraine's sovereignty. And as, as I said at this, when I was asked about this uh, a moment ago. We believe it's helpful for countries to attend and hear directly from Ukraine. And I would note that Russia apparently objects to that because you saw Russia criticizing this meeting over the weekend uh, and criticizing the fact that this meeting was held. So we, all, we think it's productive for any country to come and hear directly from Ukraine about the concerns Ukraine has. We think it was productive that China did so. In addition to attending the meeting, um, uh, Deputy Secretary Newland and the National Security Advisor held a brief uh, separate meeting with the Chinese Special Envoy. And should we read in anything into, um, you know, pictures from the weekend showed the, the Saudi official in the middle and, um, you know, to one side the Chinese official and to the other side uh, the top U.S. official, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. Are, are Saudi Arabia, China, and the U.S. really taking the lead on these talks to develop a constructive path potentially um, out of this war? So I think it's always – a little dangerous to read into anything just based on the picture. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. Um, Saudi Arabia was the host of this set of talks. It did so at Ukraine's request. Um, we think it was productive that they did so, um, and we think it's productive, just as we thought it was productive, that they invited President Zelensky to come to Saudi Arabia uh, a couple of months ago. So I wouldn't want to, to say who is in the lead for talks that right now are not happening. There are no peace negotiations going on with Russia right now uh, because Russia has refused to engage in meaningful full peace negotiations. Should there ever be peace negotiations, it's Ukraine that will be in the lead uh, from the non-Russian side. The United States is, is uh, happy to play any role that is productive uh, to stand with our Ukrainian partners, and we would welcome any other country that wants to play a productive role as well. State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller. This from the New York Times, Ukraine has replaced the Soviet emblem on one of Kiev's most prominent monuments with its own coat of arms, part of a broader push since the full-scale invasion to stamp out tributes to Russian power. The Motherland Monument, a 335-foot-tall stainless steel behemoth towering over Kiev, Ukraine's capital, was designed to assert Soviet invincibility. Unveiled in 1981, the monument is a figure of a woman raising a sword in her right hand and a shield in her left. The shield was emblazoned with the Soviet hammer and sickle. That from the New York Times. And you're listening to Washington Today. Federal Reserve Governor Michelle Bowman, writes Yahoo Finance, said Monday morning that she expects to raise interest rates despite cool reports on jobs and inflation recently. Last month, Fed officials raised interest rates for the 11th time since March 2022 in what may be the first of two rate hikes that officials have penciled in for the remainder of the year. Michelle Bowman spoke today at a Fed Listens event in Atlanta.
Federal Reserve Governor Michelle Bowman at a Fed Listens program at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. On Wall Street today, the Dow up 407, NASDAQ up 85, S&P up 40. Washington Today continues in a moment. When citizens are truly informed, our republic thrives. Get informed straight from the source on C-SPAN. Unfiltered, unbiased, word for word. From the nation's capital to wherever you are. Because the opinion that matters the most is your own. This is what democracy looks like. C-SPAN, powered by cable. Welcome back to Washington Today, which you can get as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app and wherever you find your podcasts. U.S. House and Senate are not in session this week. They continue their summer recess. That'll run until September 5th for the House and September 12th for the Senate. The Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican from Kentucky on Saturday, was at the Fancy Farm picnic and political rally in Graves County, Kentucky. Associated Press reports he received a rousing welcome from the party faithful Saturday at a high-profile home state political gathering amid renewed scrutiny of his health after the 81-year-old lawmaker froze up mid-sentence during a recent Capitol Hill news conference. But Senator McConnell was also heckled throughout the speech with chants of lost the Senate and retire. I just told... uh... I just told David Beck his introduction is longer than my speech. Elaine and I are really excited to be back at Fancy Farm. On behalf of the strongest Republican team we've ever run in our state. For those of you who keep count, this is my 28th Fancy Farm. My 28th Fancy Farm. I want to thank... uh, Father Venters and Stephen Elder for finding a way to keep Fancy Farm going, even with pork prices going through the roof. Thanks to the Kentucky State Police and local law enforcement who are keeping folks safe this weekend. Now, here's, here's the challenge for the police. Here's the challenge for the police. With the shutdown governor in charge, I'm sure state troopers are just glad to be on church property without having to tag license plates. My friends, I'll be honest, it's not hard for Republicans to look good these days. We're up against the folks who gave you record high inflation. We're up against folks who closed schools and then told you that teachers unions know what's best for your kids. We're up against folks who'd rather let repeat offenders walk free. Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell at a political rally on Saturday. It's the Fancy Farm Picnic, officially named the St. Jerome Catholic Church Picnic. Dates back to 1881. President Joe Biden returned to the White House today from vacation in Delaware and will visit three western states this week, Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah to talk about his economic priorities and what he sees as accomplishments as he runs for re-election in 2024. Today at the White House, while hosting the 2022 World Series champions, Houston Astros, he made sort of a political reference as he was talking about team manager Dusty Baker. I tell you, remarkable achievements led by, and this is not hyperbole, the legendary Dusty Baker. Worst part was I remember rooting for him as a kid, and I was older than he was. <laughs> <laughs> Dusty, it wasn't easy. People counted you out saying you're past your prime. Hell, I know something about that. <laughs> I know something about that. <laughs> President Biden at the White House with the World Series champs Houston Astros. He also said it was hard for him to read the part on the teleprompter that said the Astros beat his and First Lady Jill Biden's favorite team for the title, the Philadelphia Phillies. 106 regular season wins, the best American League in the se- the best season in the, of the, in the American League, 21 shutouts for opposing teams. 
the most in the entire league, including the postseason. Swept the Mariners, the Yankees, and the American League playoffs. And then, although I love these guys, this next part's hard to say. <laughs> then they beat the, the Phillies in six games to win the World Series. <laughs> now, you all realize that means I can't go back to Philly, you know. <laughs> President Biden at the White House with the 2022 World Series champions, Houston Astros. And per tradition, the team gave him a customized jersey, number 46, with Biden on the back. Former President Barack Obama posting on Saturday, Michelle and I are heartbroken to hear about the passing of our friend Charles Ogletree. He was an advocate for social justice, an incredible professor, and a mentor to many, including us. Our thoughts are with his wife, Pamela, his entire family, and everyone who knew and loved this remarkable man. Charles Ogletree, former Harvard Law School professor, died Friday at the age of 70. He was interviewed on C-SPAN 2's Book TV program about his book, All Deliberate Speed, Reflections on the First Half Century of Brown v. Board of Education, about the 1954 Supreme Court decision that desegregated schools and ruled that the doctrine, separate but equal, was unconstitutional. You talk about affirmative action in your book a lot. Right. Are you an affirmative action person? I am. I am Exhibit A. I'm an affirmative action baby. I, I would never, ever deny that. I think that two things. First of all, uh, just in terms of being able to have these opportunities, I did well in high school, did well in college. I'd, I've been very good as a student. What's interesting is that uh, before I, I went to Stanford, uh, Stanford had never found uh, a black person uh, from my high school uh, to go, because they weren't looking. I'm not the first qualified, but they just weren't looking. Uh, and I know that because I know that there are other people who uh, could have excelled. And beyond that, not only affirmative action was important to make sure that it was a consideration, but I was rare. Uh, a black kid from Merced, California, going to Stanford University. There were a lot of whites, fair number of women. There were no other people of color going uh, in, in any real way from, from that community. So how did it work? It worked exceptionally well. I mean, what was amazing, that I met my wife there. Pam had, uh, grew up in Baltimore, but she went to Compton High School. And she and her classmates, uh, Michelle Miller and Billy Walker, were all uh, the top students at Compton High School. Uh, Rick Turner, who's a, a, a dean at the University of Virginia, uh, was at Stanford then, and he recruited all of us. And he would find, he, what Rick did, he, he was, the man is a genius. He would find these, uh, these little diamonds in the rough uh, in these uh, either rural or urban areas and tell them about the opportunity to come to a place like Stanford. And so we took Stanford by storm. Charles Ogletree, civil rights advocate and a Harvard Law School professor until his resignation in 2020 when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, on C-SPAN's Book TV in 2004, Charles Ogletree has died at the age of 70. Today is Purple Heart Day, the Purple Heart awarded to service members wounded or killed due to enemy action. A number of elected officials posting about this. South Dakota Governor Kristi Noem, a Republican, writing, On National Purple Heart Day, we honor those who were injured downrange, defending our nation's freedoms. May we never take for granted the liberties we cherish today. And Congressman Colin Allred, Democrat from Texas, with this, today is Purple Heart Day, honoring the millions of men and women who were injured or killed while serving our country. We thank all our Purple Heart recipients for their sacrifices. The Defense Health Agency at the Department of Defense put out this one-minute video. August 7th is Purple Heart Day. Today, the Purple Heart is awarded to service members who are wounded or killed as a result of enemy action. The medal was first introduced as the Badge of Military Merit by General George Washington on August 7, 1782. He said, Let it be known that he who wears the military order of the Purple Heart has given his blood in the defense of his homeland and shall forever be revered by his fellow countrymen. The Badge of Military Merit was soon forgotten about until 1931 when Army General Douglas MacArthur revived the medal and gave it its current name and look. The medal, which features Washington's likeness, was awarded to members of the Army and Army Air Corps. However, in 1942, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the War Department expanded the eligibility to all members of the military service. It's on August 7th that we honor the heroes for their bravery. Their sacrifice has not been forgotten. A Pentagon video on this Purple Heart Day. The U.S. Army website 
says that there have been approximately 1.8 million Purple Hearts awarded since 1782. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter word for word to get the stories making news in Washington emailed to you every day. Subscribe at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night. 